bit of a break. Um, and we're glad that you can join us for this closing plenary. I also hope that you've been enjoying the day as much as I have. Um, lots of insightful speakers, panelists, and lots of great questions being put in the chat. I also, uh, if you didn't get a chance to try networking today, I strongly recommend doing the speed date networking tomorrow. It was a lot of fun and really actually makes you miss that component of in-person meetings the most where you just bump into people uh, and get to have a light chat that is sort of about the conference, but about life in general. So we're gonna have that session again tomorrow. So really I encourage everyone to do it. Uh, we're gonna head into our closing plenary session now. And you know, we started the day with, I think it was Beth Cameron saying that at its heart, global health security is multilateral. So I feel like we're coming full circle. And um, with this plenary, we are gonna actually dive deeper into that and examine uh, global health security through multilateral partnerships. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Chris Collins from Friends of the Global Fight as the moderator. Hi, Chris, welcome. Thank you for joining us and for moderating this panel. Uh, I'm going to step off the, the virtual stage and um, let the other panelists come up and let you guys take it take it from here. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Elisha, and hello to everybody. My name is Chris Collins, and I'm with Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, TB, and Malaria, and thanks very much for being with us today. And welcome to this GHC panel, Strengthening Global Health Security Through Multilateral Partnerships. During this panel, we want to talk about the present and future of pandemic <laughs> response, the roles that multilateral organizations play now, and the roles that they might play in a strengthened architecture for the future. First, let me introduce um, our panelists. Uh, Chloe Cooney, Director of U.S. Strategy at Gavi. David Lawrence, uh, Senior Advisor for the COVID-19 Response and Pandemic Preparedness at the Global Fund, and Anita Sharma, Senior Partnerships Officer at the Global Financing Facility. As you know, the world is in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. The global community so far has, far has failed to meet that challenge. We are way behind in getting vaccines, treatments, diagnostics, and other necessities to people in low and middle income countries, and we have to do better. At the same time, there is a global discussion ongoing about how to strengthen pandemic preparedness and response against future threats. The thinking being that we must assume new and dangerous pathogens are coming our way. And if we don't establish better systems of response now, the window of interest and opportunity may close. And for many of us, the pandemic preparedness and response dialogue is an opportunity to bring new focus to supporting stronger systems of health for people, expanded global health research and other areas of global health. Done right, pandemic preparedness and response advances global health equity, not just health security. That's the kind of pandemic preparedness system we all need to create. But what does that look like and what roles might current institutions play in the future of pandemic preparedness and response? That's uh, what we're going to be discussing today. I'm going to start off and ask uh, a couple questions of all of our panelists, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And please feel free to put your questions for our panelists in the um, Q&A box at any time, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. So let's dive into the opening question. And let me start with Chloe. Um, can you, uh, but I'll ask this of each of you, tell me a little bit about what Gavi does and what it does in pandemic preparedness and response now. And if you did more in that area, what would that look like? And would the organization need to change if you expanded your pandemic preparedness and response role? Um, thanks, Chris. And thanks to the Global Health Council team for having me and for having this important discussion. You know, um, pandemic preparedness and response really cuts through all of Gavi's work. Um, in our core work of routine immunization, um, we are vaccinate half the world's children against deadly diseases like measles. Um, and since the year 2000, we've reached nearly 890 million children and halved child mortality in 73 low income countries. So that is pandemic prevention at its at, at its core. Um, just last week, really excited uh, to share that our board approved funding for rollout of the malaria vaccine, which is just a historic development. Um, and we also maintain stockpiles of vaccines for diseases that have been or could be a pandemic in the future, like Ebola. 
and these can be deployed immediately, keeping us all safe. So I think that's a picture of sort of when it's working right. Um, in the case of COVID, where uh, we didn't have the vaccine at the outset of the pandemic, um, we're now in the midst of the largest vaccine rollout in history. Um, and, you know, there have been challenges, but there have been over 650 million doses shipped through COVAX to 144 countries globally. Um, and there are more than a billion doses allocated, which really shows a steep increase in delivery that's coming soon. Um, so that's tremendous step forward. But of course, we would have liked to, gotten, to have gotten to that stage a lot earlier this year. Um, and the challenges we've had to contend with export restrictions, lack of commitment from manufacturers and vaccine nationalism, they've all been well chronicled. Um, but those challenges, I think, really ultimately point us toward the lessons that we need to take for what we need to do for the next pandemic and what would scaling up pandemic preparedness and response look like. Um, and I think, you know, the news about Omicron really underscores the urgency of our task. So while we still need to know a lot more about the variant, we do know that as long as large proportions of the world's population are unvaccinated, variants will continue to appear and the pandemic will continue to be pr prolonged. Um, we're only going to prevent the new variants from emerging if we're able to prevent all of the world's population, not just the wealthy parts. So it really does demand working together to ensure equitable access to vaccines and in, in a timely fashion. Um, so, so stepping back to you know where we are at the end of 2021, um, what are those lessons learned about what what has worked and what we should be doing differently, and what would it look like to do more? You know, the three sort of core pieces I wanted to lift up were one, global cooperation, um, and the importance of that. Um, two is securing pre-pandemic resources so we're ready. And three is really having a good regional and country level emphasis in the way we approach this. Um, when it comes to global cooperation, you know, this is, I think, at the heart of the discussion today. Leaders everywhere must embrace the idea that global crises like a pandemic require global cooperation. It's a bit Pollyannish to say that, and yet it is at the heart of what we're talking about and where we've struggled to date. Um, we've said sort of from the start of the COVID-19 pandemic that no country anywhere is safe until everywhere uh, is protected. Um, and global health security, as we know, is only as strong as every country's ability to prevent or quickly subdue an emerging infectious disease outbreak. So global cooperation and multilateralism requires that we help countries become stronger and more resilient in this respect, working together. Um, so, you know, and, and unlike, I think it's just worth pointing out, other traditional security threats, infectious disease can't be solved through bilateral mechanisms like sanctions, military posturing, deterrence, or bilateral diplomacy. It really requires the scientific collaboration and long-term investment in global health and health systems, and none of that can be achieved without strategic multilateralism. Um, you know, we can't solve global solutions in isolation. Um, and, and I think, you know, many leaders have spoken eloquently to this point and sincerely even about their country's support for global cooperation around the pandemic. And yet a large share of the COVID vaccine supply was bought up early by the wealthiest nations. Several imposed in, uh, export restrictions that have hindered the free flow to parts of the world that need it desperately. Um, and combined, these actions by governments have severely constrained the global supply of COVID vaccines and caused the delays. So while we preach multilateralism, we're not always affecting it. Um, this, I'll be quicker on the second two points, just pre-pandemic resources. You know, in order to have effective global cooperation, we have to have resources and mechanisms in place before a pandemic arises. So looking ahead, to the next pandemic, which again is an evolutionary certainty. If we want a faster response, the next time we need something like COVAX already in place, something that makes the best use of existing global health uh, systems, institutions, networks, and that builds on existing expertise, infrastructure, and resources. We don't want to have to create something new or have people or learning on the go in the moment when the stakes are the highest. And with financing already in place, 
we don't want to we wouldn't have to lose valuable time in raising funds in the case of covax we we had to raise the money before we could buy the vaccine so it really put us at the back of the line across the board um, in terms of procurement um, and before the next pandemic global health agencies also that are going to be front and center and leading a response have to have surge capacity you know we we really tout often the the merits of lean approaches um, and that can be great in in times when there's not a crisis but one of the biggest lessons learned that we at Gavi and, and COVAX learned is that, you know, even though COVAX was launched and mobilized in record time, it, it could have been done much faster um, and better if, if, if we'd already been in place before the crisis began. If we had some surge capacity institutionally to deploy rather than building and creating the shop as, as, as it hit. Um, so, you know, by the time COVAX raised sufficient funding, built the team to raise the funding, built the structures, most of the su supply was already secured. Um, and as I said, we were at the back of the line. So that really just means making the necessary investments now in the systems that we have that are on the front lines and need to be deployed in a crisis. Um, and the last point is just regional and country level emphasis that you know we, we, we have to do this globally, but we also really have to have the structures and tools at the regional country and local levels to prevent, detect, and respond quickly to a disease outbreak before it spreads far and wide. And you know, the, this is at, at its heart investing in primary healthcare and vaccination programs and all the core um, <clears throat> elements of uh, that keep communities safe, which play such a pivotal and ongoing role in preventing an outbreak, but also responding to it. So, um, you know, vaccines are, of course, one of the most cost effective ways uh, to limit the rise of a known infectious disease outbreak. But we need that whole system as well to to spot what's coming um, and, and to figure out how to respond. So I'll pause there because I'm sure there's a lot more discussion to be had. But, you know, I think um, it's hard to stop in the middle of the crisis and, and gather lessons learned. And yet that's kind of where we we need to be as we think about the future of pandemic preparedness and response. Great. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, Dave, um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the Global Fund does, what it does in pandemic preparedness and response, including on COVID-19? And if the organization were do, to do more in pandemic preparedness and response, what would that look like and what would need to change in the organization if that were to happen? Thanks, Chris, and good evening. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here with you, and thank you to the GHC for the invitation. Um, so for starters, the, the Global Fund is a partnership-based fund that was uh, launched roughly 20 years ago uh, in direct response to uh, pandemics and epidemics. Um, so that's really where our origins lie. And at this point, we're um, we're allocating roughly $4 billion uh, annually uh, to approximately 130 uh, recipient uh, countries, primarily low and middle income countries, in support of HIV, TB, and malaria programs, national programs, and the health and the community systems that, that support those programs. Uh, a, a major uh, proportion um, of the, the $4 billion is um, directed towards what we refer to as resilient and sustainable systems for health or health systems, including some of the most conventional ones um, in laboratory, uh, disease surveillance systems, workforce, et cetera. Uh, folks uh, may be familiar with the Lancet analysis that was published in January of this year. Um, it was a retrospective analysis um, uh, of the last two allocation periods, roughly 10 countries, the takeaway was that roughly one third of global fund HIV, TB and malaria financing and health and community systems financing uh, was in support of PPR. Um, and specifically that involved a mapping to key capacities in the international health regulations and in the joint external evaluation technical framework. Um, so that just gave us a, a sense for the, the strong uh, cross-cutting support leveraged from these um, HIV, TB, and malaria uh, investment streams to PPR. Now, <clears throat> fast forward to uh, last month, um, our board uh, recently approved a new 
strategic objective, an evolving objective um, on PPR. So for the first time, Global Fund strategy um, <clears throat> has, has expanded beyond this um, core and foundational objective around HIV, TB, and malaria in health and community systems <clears throat> with a very strong filter on human rights, gender, and equity-based programming to also uh, incorporate PPR. Now, there's a lot that we still don't know today about what that will mean, but uh, but there's uh, there are eight sub-objectives, and those those sub-objectives um, again they're they're familiar to us when um, when we look at the HTM and RSSH or health systems uh, programming that uh, many are familiar with at country level in our grants, and they're also familiar to us um, to those of us who are accustomed to looking at national action plans for health security, uh, and and some of the um, you know the the plans that drive uh, health security and PPR investments at country level. Now, the other the other key piece to this this uh, um, this response, though, is of course COVID nineteen. And in the past fifteen months or so, the Global Fund has allocated, in addition to the uh, the, the core grants and the the four billion um, that I spoke of earlier, um, an additional four billion uh, roughly has been allocated to these same countries to help them respond to their um, COVID. Uh, epidemics. And that has involved, um, particularly recently in, in 2021, really harnessing uh, the WHO uh, operational pillar response frameworks, ensuring that there's collaboration between the, the country coordinating mechanisms, the country governance bodies of the Global Fund, um, and, and the national COVID response bodies um, in order to develop uh, robust technical and financially aligned um, proposals to support the national responses. That's also been complemented by a lot of new partnership through the ACT A um, uh, partnership framework, the diagnostics, the therapeutics, and now the, the health systems response connector, um, and, a, and a number of other partnership fora that have really been pivotal uh, at ensuring that um, we've developed very quickly but high quality technical guidance to support countries in developing those funding requests um, and to assure appropriate monitoring and oversight where accountability has been really one of the, the, the strong points of the Global Fund model. Um, Chris, on the last point um, regarding, okay, let me, let me give a few concrete examples. Okay, what, what could we do more of? Um, some, some very uh, you know, obvious, I think, intuitive ones. On the laboratory side, specimen transport and referral systems, we do that now for HIV, for TB in particular, um, and we we could do more of that. Really broaden that and build that system out in ways that are, are again linked to some of the the core capacities um, that are defined within the the ITAR and JE frameworks um, on disease surveillance systems, where we invest heavily in integrated HIV and TB malaria reporting systems, national reporting systems, for example, using DHS2, and where there's an integrated disease surveillance and response module on the very same platform, a very simple extension of that, that financing, where um, field epidemiology training, uh, targeting uh, peripheral workforce, health workforce, um, community workers can be extended um, you know, beyond HIV, TB, and malaria uh, in ways that are fundamental to early uh, outbreak detection and response. And then lastly, event-based surveillance, really focusing on community health workers and the capacities that we need frontline community health workers to, to have in order to, again, play a role in effective um, detection and response of emerging outbreaks. These are all just some very practical things that I think with, you know, with very little um, adjustment, I think could be brought into scope um, of the Global Fund going forward. Um, Chris, let me stop there. Uh, maybe I could, uh, I, I think I might have spoken a little bit too long there. So I can pick up on that last point if you will, if you want, in the next question. Over. Sure. No, that's sure. great. Uh, now let's go to Anita. And Anita, can you tell us a little bit about what your organization does now? What does it do in pandemic preparedness and response? If it did more in this area, what would that look like? And how would the organization need to change if you did that? Yeah, thank you, Chris. And 
It's great to be with you all virtually uh, as part of this uh, last panel and great to be with the other G's, uh, Gavi Global Fund and the Global Financing Facility often are called the, the three G's. Um, and also thank you to the Global Health Council. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so for those uh, either kind of newer to the GFF, um, just to say a quick word about us. Um, we were started in 2015 as part of the every Woman, Every Child effort uh, to help close the financing gap uh, and to end preventable maternal and child deaths and promote uh, sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, we are a global partnership. We're based at the World Bank. Um, and so that enables the GFF with our 36 partner countries to link small amounts of grant financing with larger amounts of IDA and IBRD loans um, to catalyze a country-led process and align much larger volumes <clears throat> of domestic and external financing behind a prioritized national plan. Um, we really focus on involving the health and nutrition of women, children, and adolescents with a focus on equity, bolstering health systems, and in turn, strengthening global health security. So very similar, just to pick up on what Chloe and, and David were saying about the work that the GFF does um, to complement and support pandemic health response. Um, you know, I would say that at the GFF, you know, we have been really focusing on two um, primary areas, you know, since the, be the beginning of the pandemic and really at the outset of the pandemic is where uh, our countries and our partners started to raise the alarm bells looking at the effects of the pandemic on the secondary health crises. In fact, we saw about 25 percent reduction in access to uh, essential services and, and life-saving interventions. And then recent, um, our, some of our recent findings suggest that um, COVID, there has been more than twice uh, the deaths to COVID have been caused by uh, inability to access services, which is really, really shocking. Um, and so our response, and, and, and I guess you could call it COVID um, response programs, pandemic response, um, has been really focused at protecting and promoting access to essential health and the continuation of essential health services for the most vulnerable populations in our 36 um, low-income countries, and also strengthening frontline and community primary care services and systems. And that's to help partner countries prepare for the equitable, affordable, and safe delivery of vaccine um, and their tools, which is what Chloe and, and David were just um, supporting, uh, were, were just talking about. Um, and so we also utilized our learning platforms um, that we had, um, you know, already had in existence, um, which speaks to, you know, the, the partnership that we have developed through the country-based um, uh, model as well. Um, through support from our donors, um, we are now supporting 18 countries with what we call the COVID-19 Essential Health Service Grants. And these are complementary um, grants that will help train and protect health workers, engage the community to address COVID-19 fears and vaccine hesitancy, promote the use of essential health services, support emergency transport, and increase supplies to oxygen and blood. Um, and these grants are part of GFS contribution to delivering on Act A. Uh, we are part, along with Gavi, uh, sorry, along with the Global Fund, WHO, and the World Bank, we're part of the Health Systems and Response Connector. Um, and earlier this year, we launched a resource mobilization campaign of, of um, $1.2 billion this year, of which about $700 million um, is for those COVID-19 essential health services um, grants. Um, now, to answer your question, or the first part of your question, Chris, um, about our uh, our work on PPR, I mean, we really feel that it is part of a robust health system and response. 
And so the pandemic has shown us that among the best health emergency response systems are strong primary and community level care that can be surged during an outbreak. So Chloe, very much in agreement with what you had said. I mean, often in the countries and the, uh, the partners that we work with, the health worker in the remote village is the same person who delivers nutrition and family planning services and COVID-19 vaccines. And similarly, community engagement activity that address pandemic fears and vaccine hesitancy can also promote the use of several uh, essential health services. And so this is really complementary, and it's exactly what we hear uh, from our partner countries and community partners. So our efforts um, and what I would say that what we could you know, continue to work on and do more uh, in PPR is equipping health systems, bolstering health systems and equipping health workers with better tools, improved systems and more training, then they're prepared to cope with the current pan pandemic and protect patients, and that we feel that these gains both help to support the broader health system and deliver quality care. So, you know, our response and what I would say, you know, things that we could, you know, work to uh, improve or, or do better, all of us collectively, is that, um, you know, with the current challenges and delivery and demand, and so how we balance procurement of products and vaccines and service delivery, as well as the demand for essential health services. So of those essential health services grants that I mentioned, we also have had about 31 requests from Minnesota of finance to support essential health services. So we call it two sides of the same coin, being able to respond um, to the pandemic specifically with vaccines and support the systems as well as the essential health services. Um, you know, and I know we've been talking about this all day, but one of the lessons from the COVID pandemic, which is now entering into its second year, is that in our experience from past ep epidemics is that the world moves along quickly and new priorities um, may potentially supersede the need for investments in prevention and preparedness. So, you know, really thinking about how we capitalize on the global momentum and the political appetite to strengthen pandemic preparedness and prevention. Um, the other thing, or maybe the last thing I would mention before, go can people hear me or is that Chloe? Did oh, you okay, good. <laughs> Wasn't sure if, if, if anyone was losing me. Okay. Um, as I was mentioning before, in terms of tackling the pandemic and then building back better by strengthening health systems, um, I think we can and we must uh, do both at once. And that's what at the GFF partnership that we are aiming to do. Um, as part of our financing request, we're calling it the Reclaim the Gains campaign. So reclaiming the gains that had been made for women, children, and adolescent health and well-being before the pandemic, building back better with a focus on inequities, um, rebuilding community and primary health systems, supporting community health workers, scaling up innovations and in service delivery and scaling up cash transfer programs. These gains we really feel and not just feel, but know from our partner countries that, that the gains will be felt in the broader health systems and help to deliver quality care. Um, and as we work together um, in our multilateral institutions and with our partners at the Global Fund and Gavi and others, we're helping countries build access to those critical commodities and systems in the workforce that is required. And at the end of the day, um, whether you call it PPR or um, bolstering frontline uh, delivery, it's really one of the best defenses for current and future pandemics. But ultimately, and I know Chloe, you said this and David as well, you know, collaboration with the G's and the multilateral institutions and our role with ACT A and um, the Global Action Plan, among others, is really, really important and critical to ensure cohesion and complementarity. The most important piece is how we translate what is happening at the global level to country level and working with our country partners that supports country needs, uh, bolsters country leadership and country ownership. Um, you know, that is the that is the name of, of the game. Um, and so, you know, 
how we take this collective responsibility and this opportunity to make real and life-term change happen through pandemic response and preparing for the next pandemic is something that, um, you know, at the GFF, we are really, really laser focused on um, doing uh, both uh, at the same time. And hopefully, um, you know, this, this will be a, ultimately a pandemic that um, we'll be able to come out of this with more resilient health systems to be prepared for future shocks. Thanks. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that, and 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 really am glad to hear everybody highlight that a lot of better pandemic preparedness is about investing in people. It's about investing in healthcare workers and in community systems that we've seen are absolutely essential in COVID nineteen and aren't adequately supported. Right? Aren't aren't adequately protected? Uh, there's not enough PPP out there for for health workers in many areas. Um, folks aren't getting compensated appropriately. So that's a big area, I think, is, is the people side um, of, of pandemic preparedness and response. You're all speaking to that. I also just want to say this is a really important conversation and maybe I hope the first of many because we need to drill down here. I mean, if you think about the two big reports that have come out this year that I'm aware of and on, on pan pandemic preparedness and response, you've got the IPPPR report from the spring, um, from earlier in the year. And then um, about halfway through the year, we had the G20 high level panel. Both of those uh, reports on the future of pandemic preparedness and response talk about how we really need to rely on current institutions that are doing well as we think about designing the future of pandemic preparedness and response. We need to think about how to support them. In some cases, maybe um, alter their mandate somewhat. Um, but in any event that, you know, reinventing the wheel doesn't make sense here, more silos in global health doesn't make sense. Rather, I think all of us as a community in global health need to be thinking about what does it look like to uh, build out national programs, but also international institutions that are working well. So with that in mind, let's go to the, to the follow-up question. Um, you know, um, you've all spoken about how your institutions might be able to play a bigger role in pandemic preparedness and response. Are there any risks there in terms of your current mandate? Um, you know, continuing to be able to get out the basic vaccines or uh, make progress against AIDS, TB and malaria or build stronger health systems. Does taking on a bigger PPR role put any of those core pieces of your mandate at risk? And if so, how do you mitigate that? Chloe, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, just to go back to what you you just said, Chris, about not reinventing the wheel. I, I think that's where the biggest risk is: is that if we look ahead and try and create new systems outside of the existing structures, we we stand to have a lot of chaos uh, and confusion, and you know, new kids on the block trying to learn at the point at which you want most expert. Um, best, you know, seasoned workers leading the helm. Um, but, you know, you also stand to have entities that kind of gather dust waiting for the next pandemic. And, and we know it's coming. We know it's an evolutionary certainty. But is it going to be in two years? Is it going to be in 15 years? We don't know the timeline. And so how do you have um, institutions and structures ready and with the best sort of learnings, most, you know, cutting edge tools and, and, and skill sets and workforce able to deploy uh, if it's, it's something that's sitting there just sitting and waiting. So it really is about building on the system that we have um, and, and strengthening it. Um, you know, I think, um, and it's, you know, the, 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 the three G's as we talked about are, are, are really key pieces. And, and building the workforce of these institutions, but also really talking about the, pub, the the primary healthcare system, right? I mean, so much of what is happening right now in in COVID, in in, in getting vaccines, turning vaccines into vaccinations, as um, and the administrator Power spoke about earlier this week at her ministerial, is about is is, is on the backs of of primary healthcare systems, and we want to make sure that we're not you know, simply replacing a COVID shot that would have been a measles shot, for instance. We don't want to see a rise in measles as we fight COVID. Um, at the same time, we need to tackle this, you know, 
really urgently. So it's, I think, building out what's there um, and not trying to create parallel structures um, so that the whole system does continue to work together. Because, you know, we, we as we all see with COVID, and, and Anita, you, you raised this, just simply having um, COVID's not the only health crisis we're facing. We need the rest of the system to stay strong at the same time we're doing this as well. Great, thanks. And um, also, I just want to remind folks that you can uh, please do put any questions you have um, in the Q&A or the comments box. I see we have one from uh, David Bryden already, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But let's uh, go along now and hear from David about, you know, if there's an expanded expanded work for the Global Fund and PPR, does that present risks and or opportunities for the Global Fund? And, and how do you mitigate any risk? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Of course, we could flip it. I think the uh, the effects that we've seen of the COVID pandemic on HIV, TB, malaria services, and on the gains made over the past twenty years, hard fought, um, might uh, might lead us down take that direction that question in the opposite direction. But let me take it straight up. Um, I think one of the one of the most obvious risks and concerns for the Global Fund is preserving the integrity of the responses to HIV, TB, malaria. We're talking about durable funding. Uh, there are limited resources. And it's imperative that as we think about the future, uh, we think about next year's replenishment, that we ensure that we're able to, to safeguard, and not only safeguard, but really to progress, to make up some of the ground that's been lost, and really to keep charging towards the SDG goals in 2030. So that's that's got to be um, assured. I think governance is another another challenge. Um, Global Fund's uh, model, progressive, participatory, uh, representative, transparent, and highly accountable governance at country level and, and at global level is has really been a uh, you know a, a tremendous paradigm for modern um, global health, and and that's something that we think and we hope could really pay huge dividends for the health security and the PPR enterprise as well to really transform and progress governance. But how to do that, that's, it's challenging. We, we know, practically speaking, at country level, that health sector governance and multi-sectoral governance is oftentimes limited, fraught, complicated. And, and we, we need to be thinking about how to, how to solve those problems because the governance will ensure that we, we see funding requests that are thoughtful, holistic, integrated, looking at HIV, TB, malaria, and related health and community systems in ways that are equally about the, the ITAR and the JE capacities, and, and how to do that in a way that's really convincing um, and, and compelling to, to all the stakeholders at country level. Um, so that's I think that's a challenge. And then we see that further upstream for the Global Fund. The, there will be questions, implications for our internal governance, how our funding requests reviewed appropriately for PPR in ways that are robust and holistic in, in all these ways. And then upstream, our grants advisory committee and, and even our, our board. So a lot of a, a lot of important questions there. I want to call out that I, you know, I think we've been um, greatly uh, reassured and inspired by um, what's coming out of some of the WHO led convenings that are really drawing on lessons learned from the global COVID pandemic, some of the limitations Two, in order to fortify the, the JEE uh, and the, the pandemic preparedness uh, framework, some specific areas. Lo and behold, bringing in continuity or maintenance of essential health services into that framework as a, a key part of preparedness. That's, that's an exciting er area where Global Fund feels that um, from a, a thought leadership advocacy and from a, uh, a, a programming standpoint, we can really contribute. Infection prevention and control never a discrete domain in these in, in these preparedness frameworks until now, we think, we hope. And, and obviously stemming from the, the COVID pandemic response, um, we, we just know how fundamental and important that is. And, and it's been this a blind spot of sorts in the, in the health systems investments that the, the, the global health community has been making. So that's, that's really exciting. And then lastly, and I think you touched on this earlier, but the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has shown that countries that have engaged communities, not only around risk communication and making sure that those the communications that go go um, out uh, around public health and social measures, but but really about engaging communities in the response itself in ways that are quite um, 
primary and quite functional, it, it have, have had the greatest success. And, and WHO has learned from that and, and, and they've listened to some global partners, uh, including from civil society on that. And I think we see a fortified framework for pandemic preparedness that's quite exciting. Um, and that really enhances the roles of communities, not only in risk communication again, but, but in other areas of, the, uh, of, of pandemic preparedness and response. So um, in one of the dimensions that I had been meaning to call out there, very explicitly for the first time, gender dimensions um, of pandemic preparedness um, in, the, in the risk communication and community engagement um, domain and beyond. So, so again, there's, there's a, a lot of positive progress here. Um, and I, I, I guess I ended up flipping that around a little bit whilst, whilst responding, uh, Chris. So I, I, can, uh, I can follow up any further um, if helpful, but I'll turn it over to you again, over. Okay, great, okay, great. that is all right. Um, Anita, uh, you, uh, for, for you and, and your organization, um, in going deeper into PPR, are there risks, are there opportunities? How do you mitigate the risks? Yeah, I think the way, as I mentioned, the way that we approached um, our response was to stay core to the GFF mandate, which is to you know support the health and well-being of women and children and adolescents. And so what does that mean in terms of COVID? And we had decided that uh, through a very consultative process with our country partners, that that again was was staying core to our mandate through protecting essential health services. That in some cases, um, where countries either through lockdowns or uh, communities afraid to access services were just you know they were unable to go to the health clinic or now because of the economic downturn are unable to have the financial resources to to um, uh, to access those services. So, you know, in terms of, you know, our support through the PPR is complementary through those essential health services. And then, um, you know, as part of the ACT Day Health System Connector, um, working to provide, you know, complementary support uh, to vaccine delivery and, and helping with those systems. So I think for us, we we at the GFF looked at what the core mandate was and the request from countries um, and, you know, not so much pick the lane, but really saw where our value add through the country led model and process um, uh, was. Uh, and then of course, you know, Chloe um, and David, you know, through the equity lens and and through gender, gender responsive um, approaches as well. I will say, you know, in, in going back to what we had talked about with um, bolstering uh, and protecting frontline service delivery um, and, and stronger health systems. The GFF, we um, we just published our annual report. It's for 2020 and the first half of 2021. Um, but in looking at the indicators um, across the portfolio, uh, we saw a mixed picture. Um, and, in, in, and in some countries and in uh, in, in other uh, places, uh, some of the indicators, progress was made uh, for women, children, adolescent health. And the reason for that, or one of the reasons for that is areas that had, in countries that had invested in, in health systems and primary health care and frontline delivery and supporting community health workers, et cetera, et cetera, they were able to withstand the shocks a bit better. So I think that that kind of speaks to, um, you know, our core work and the core mandate. So I don't, uh, you know, for the GFF, I think, um, you know, as part of our support to supporting robust health systems. I think that's, there's not too much of a, um, a challenge that we would kind of, you know, stray or invest. I mean, it's a, we feel that a, we have a complementary role to play, um, you know, whether it's this pandemic or the next. I will also say, you know, as part of the work that the GFF also does, you know, on a daily basis in working with countries, um, either through tracking data, um, monitoring essential health services, um, household surveys, et cetera, um, um, that work um, and through our resource tracking really helps to kind of understand what the supply and demand challenges are, um, both for COVID-19 tools and, and essential health services delivery. So again, um, and I'm going to sound like a broken record of, of how we think it's two sides of the same coin. And I don't, you know, see that, um, you know, there's a, any tendency to kind of, you know, lurch to, to one side or the other. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And um 
Yeah, I think this is this is really important. I mean, you know, and, and echoing something that you said too, when we're thinking about the lessons to take away from COVID nineteen, obviously there, we're a long way from from done there. But you know, one thing I think that we have seen is with along with all the huge impacts on health systems and economies and individuals and and communities, there has been areas of great resilience in health programming and ways in which programming that was there already really served as the bulwark for countries to change and, and respond to COVID-19. Um, in many cases, a lot of that strength has to do with community systems, which, you know, those systems are able to reach people, establish trust, reach marginalized folks. Um, and obviously, you know, um, you know, we, we, we talk about how, uh, as Chloe mentioned, you know, everybody's only as safe as the weakest health system. In a pandemic too, every community is only as safe as the most marginalized in that community. You know, you in order to address pandemics, you've got to be reaching everybody. So thinking about those things that have worked well in COVID-19, those community systems among them that have been able to build trust and, and reach everybody, I think that's going to be really important to understand where we go next. Let's start with uh, some of your questions in the audience. And we've gotten a couple great ones and I encourage folks to put new questions uh, in the comment box. Um, but let's uh, go to a question from David Bryden. Um, and he asks, should there be a financial intermediary fund for pandemic preparedness and response and how should it channel resources what should it finance? And so that that's an idea that's uh, a fifth, we call it financial intermediary fund, an idea that's been put forward by the United States um, that we need to create a, a, a fund that can be drawn upon to do pandemic preparedness and response. Um, what do folks think about a fifth um, or other ways of approaching this? Chloe, do you have? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think you know, it, it's getting to the central idea of what the need there is, and, and it's that we need contingent funding to be able to jumpstart a response, because otherwise we're always going to be in a situation where wealthy countries are able to move much faster um, than low income countries. And if we're going to, if there's any chance of sort of taking a more equitable approach, it requires having money in the system that can move quickly. I think the the consideration to have is, um, you know, how is that money structured and is it able to move quickly? Is it is it deployable easily? Because I think that's still a challenge we're dealing with in the system right now with COVID, where there is actually quite a lot of money sitting in some parts of the world that that um, the way it's structured isn't as, as accessible as um, would have been helpful. But, you know, without a doubt, you know, had, had COVAX existed and had funding to start, we wouldn't be at 650 million vaccines delivered right now, we'd be at a much higher number. Um, and that is strictly because wealthy nations had the money up front and could get first in line. Um, and, and we had to sort of raise it and then get in line. So that the, the money being there and, and rapidly deployed is really, I think, the central goal that we need to build, build on. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, however it works, we absolutely need new financing here. This is a point that Vice President Harris made um, at the global COVID summit several months ago that, you know, the United States is seeking to get $10 billion set aside right away for pandemic preparedness and response. The, the two reports I referred to earlier are calling for something more in the order of $10 billion a year for adequate preparedness. So however it's done, um, uh, absolutely new money, not rearranging the deck chairs, not zero sum game, but this is the moment to invest adequately now in global health um, to make all of us safer. Um, Anita or David, did you have a comment on uh, on this question about a fifth? Not required. Yeah. Anita? No, David, I'll, I'll let you go. I would just say, you know, if it's, uh, similar to the requirement for additional financing um, and had here, you know, whether it um, materializes through the, the U.S. contribution or other um, other countries supporting it, I think from the, the GFF standpoint, is, as, as it would connect into the work that we are doing around health systems and, and support. So agree that there's, there's definitely need for additional resources. Um, 
and then just putting in the, the plug as well for, for our own resources. They're not asking for, for the money that is required for the FIF. Um, but as far as our resource mobilization, um, uh, we have been, uh, we put together a new strategy um, actually right before the pandemic, but it very much um, aligns with, with the work um, that is ongoing now and the needs that are ongoing now. Our strategy is through 2021 to 2025. I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't uh, put in a plug um, for funding the strategy, but for this year, um, we are seeking through to support through the COVID, as I mentioned, uh, $1.2 billion. So that's not the conversation on the fifth, I understand, but I just thought I'd, I'd put that in as a little plug right now. Thanks. That is okay. <laughs> David, did you, did you have a comment? Um, just a, just a, a quick one. I think from the, from the global fund perspective, um, you know, without uh, consideration, if you will, to the, the broader existential questions around the global health architecture and how to um, reach higher economies of scale, the, the 10 billion per year, Chris, that you alluded to. But from a global fund perspective, whether um, we're talking about being designated as a, a sort of um, preferred global health organization for a World Bank-based FIF, or whether the, the sort of um, donor relationship is in the more traditional sense, based on our current model, um, in, in the resource mobilization that involves, as you know, an array of bilateral uh, private philanthropic uh, and other sources. Um, I think Global Fund feels that you know we're we're ready to to play a, a heightened role in e in either case, um, and we we're sort of deferring those um, those questions to um, to other policy experts, if you will. Over. Yeah, no, understood. And you've got a big replenishment coming up next year. And for all these groups, with the replenishments that are coming up for you. You know, that's part of the question is to what degree is pandemic and expanded pandemic preparedness or response role for your organizations factored into what goes into your replenishment? And that's going to be, I think, a big part of the debate and one way this debate uh, and discussion plays out in, in this year. Um, well, let's stay with David Bryden. He's got another question. Um, which is, um, do you think a very limited fiscal space threatens progress and more debt relief is needed? Um, in other words, how to allow country space to employ more health workers if they need to? Oh, and there's the question. Uh, would anyone like to respond to that? Well, I, I can jump in. I, I, I do think, again, this gets at the funding. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to approach uh, supporting communities in this moment in countries um, and, you know, countries shouldn't be taking on debt to combat COVID when we all need every country to combat COVID. So I, I think that's just a starting point. And, and certainly in some cases that's happening and, and the fiscal and, and, and economic, you know, impacts of COVID obviously are, are, are another piece of the way in which we're in a global crisis together. Um, but at, it, you know, at its coarest level, we need countries to take and, and expand their vaccination and we shouldn't be burdening them, um, particularly again, at a moment when low income countries have been last in line. Um, so, you know, I think this is a good example of where the equitable approach is also the smartest approach um, and sort of the most selfish approach in a sense of ensuring that we're all safe together. Um, I did wanna build on just sort of the this um, question about, um, uh, Chris, you were talking about with with additional funding needed. I, I think one of the ways that we have to look ahead is, you know, I, I mentioned the Ebola stockpile we have. You know, increasingly we're looking at the supply of COVID vaccine as not simply a question of coverage. We're in the race to get to the coverage, but it's also a risk mitigation tool. You know, how do we have, how do we ensure we have, um, even while we're trying to get you know, 70% coverage or, or wherever country targets are uh, for their, their primary dosing of, of COVID vaccine, how are we prepared so that when the next 
wave of vaccine needs are coming in and it's already happening, that we're positioned to deploy quickly and we're not reinventing the same problem we started with in 2020 and 2021 of, you know, booster doses taking much longer than, uh, you know, in low income countries than they did in, in wealthy countries. So how do we keep reinventing? We know that we can't predict what's coming, um, but we can build the reserve and, and the strategic pandemic pool to be ready to have the tools the second that guidance comes out and, and deploy them efficiently. So I think that's part of the way, you know, as we think about coming, uh, the lessons learned of this pandemic and building the financial structure going forward, that we're looking at that. Great, great, thank you. Other comments from Anita David on, on that piece? Yeah, I would just say, I mean, the reductions or the limited fiscal space combined with um, reductions in, in ODA is really concerning, especially when, you know, this is a time when more financing is needed. Um, so that's just, a, you know, a, a statement. And then, you know, one of the things for, for the GFF and with our partner countries, you know, in looking at the demand side financing and, you know, the increases in out-of-pocket expenses, the inability of um, you know people to access services because they're not able to pay for them. Um, you know, one of the things that that we've been doing is through our partners and through the essential health services grants is to look at cash transfers. I think, as I mentioned. Um, uh, and, uh, and and in other ways through social protection schemes. Um, so we're just embarking on a new project with uh, with the bank, looking at uh, social protection safety nets as as one way to enable. Um, access to care and services. And then, um, yeah, I mean, David, you you know this really well, just the um, the challenges that countries have to, to pay uh, for their health workers and when it's, it, it is so, so critical. Um, so, you know, with the, with the, the GFF is it, through the work that, that we do to, with the grant financing, that's, you know, that's linked to larger amounts of, of the loans. And I know that is an active conversation uh, at the bank and through the IDA replenishment, um, you know, some really live conversations on on increases to, to debt relief. So I would say, you know, just, I guess, watch this space um, and through the advocacy, you know, at the, at the bank and other places. All right, thank you. So we've got a question from uh, Jamie uh, Nishi um, and interesting because uh, I, I think this is, helps us, uh, oh, there it is, uh, broaden this conversation because, you know, you're all clearly doing incredibly important major aspects of PPR, your organizations, um, but, you know, probably not everything in PPR. So, and here's, this question goes to one of those areas, perhaps. How about leveraging the financial intermediary fund for investing in filling country pandemic preparedness rather than exclusively as a contingency fund? In other words, you know, spend that money as you go to strengthen health systems. For example, strengthening national and regional surveillance and uh, capabilities to and to develop a range of medical countermeasures. To my knowledge, R&D capacity strengthening, strengthening isn't covered by the three G's on this panel. So I uh, would love your comments in terms of, yeah, is that an appropriate role for a new fund or new funding? How does the R&D component of PPR get done? Who has a thought there? Dave? I can I can add in quickly. So my understanding of the the conception of the World Bank based FIF um, is that it would be more than just a contingency fund. It, it would in fact be intended to support um, financing in pandemic preparedness at country level, um, including potentially through a, a mix of grants and uh, loan requests, etc. Uh, you know, in, in an ongoing basis, and it, and it would potentially uh, be complemented by, uh, you know, emergency response contingency funding, whether it be the ongoing COVID pandemic or other emerging pandemics along the way. But it, but it was, it was broad based and multifaceted in that respect. The second, on the second, in the the second piece of that on R and D, um, and I, this is. You know, this is uh, almost through the rumor mill, but through the ministerials and the discussions that have been had over the past few months, um, I know that you know Global Fund, Gavi, and CEPI um, are some of the organizations that have been 
um, discussed as among the global health organizations that may be recipients um, through a World Bank based FIF. Um, CEPI, you know, I think would uh, would be uh, in the, in that role, the kind of the R and D role, perhaps, um, or at least you know one of the one of the actors potentially in in that in that niche. Um, there are obviously others that could support there, but uh, but uh, but against the the kind of core competencies that say of Gavi and the Global Fund, that would that would be the fit there. Over. Thank you. Other comments on this question. Well, one piece I, I wanted to lift up that I think, um, you know, is a really, we haven't touched on, but but I think, you know, this pandemic has really highlighted the disparity in manufacturing capacity and, and where manufacturing capacity exists. Um, and it's not the simplest of solutions, but with without a doubt, there needs to be more manufacturing capacity in the global south and, and particularly um, in Africa. Because um, in the fight against infectious diseases, it's not just the total volume of supplies that counts, but it's also how those vaccines are distributed. And, and we've seen that the geography of vaccine um, has a political dimension just as much as anything else. Um, so realizing that vision, you know, has is, is more than just building a facility. And I, I think that's where a lot of thought needs to be put. Um, you know, it has to be sustainable, a sustainable system of of, for instance, African va vaccine manufacturing that builds on principles that are cross-border global partnership, um, tech transfer, and so on. Um, but there needs to be an analysis of what sort of the routine markets should be targeted. Because again, if you have manufacturing only for, you know, a vaccine that might be used for, you know, in the case of a pandemic or in, in, in a rare flare-up, you're not going to have uh, a manufacturing capacity that's cutting edge, that's able to sustain itself, um, and and that is flourishing. Um, and again, you want the entities, the institutions, the networks that are strongest, that are most up to date, um, and that are thriving to be the ones uh, on the front line in a crisis. So, um, so that's definitely a huge lesson learned coming out of COVID, and one that um, Gavi is certainly really committed to pursuing. Um, in an area that um, for, for investment, but, but again, building out really a sustainable system. Yeah, it's one more example how if we do pandemic preparedness and response investment wisely, it really is an engine for global health equity on a whole variety of levels from investing in community systems and health workers to systems for health uh, but also to research capacity and uh, manufacturing capacity around the world that's more evenly distributed. So there's all these ways that if we're willing to make these PPR investments and rise to the occasion here, we really are going to be advancing health equity in the medium term as well. Uh, a real opportunity. I mean, there's ways in which if we do it right, PPR should be a movement um, because what we're talking about is is right in, in, the, in the medium term, um, getting more health to more people. Um, Anita, did you have a, a comment before we go to the next question? Great, great. So here's a question that allow, allows you to uh, elaborate on just what we've just been talking about. Um, could taking on a bigger PPR role um, help you reinforce and support primary health care? And can you spell that out a little bit? Well, well, I'll just say that va vaccine manufacturing, I think, is a good example, um, though, again, I think it's not the solution to the current crisis. It's a good example of being prepared for both the next crisis, but also building the system as a whole going forward. Yeah, and then just briefly, to say, sorry, go ahead. Do you want to go, David? David? OK, no, it was really just saying, you know, uh, it, what I was illustrating um, in many cases with the community health workers needing to deliver the services on a multitude of fronts. And then if you are giving her the, the tools, the, the PPE, um, the training um, that she needs to deliver those services, I mean, it's, it's again, it's two sides of the same, the same coin um, because you're, you're administering the vaccines in a, in a very holistic way. And at the same time, you're, you're strengthening the systems for, for the 
the next pandemic. So, um, and then, you know, Chloe, to what you were just mentioning in terms of, uh, you know, reaching the most mar marginalized, um, the focus, if you do have a very robust frontline health system, then they are reaching that last mile of services, you know, and if you can get the procurement and the tools that are necessary to that last mile, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in a way in itself, you know, uh, um, addressing the, the health system's needs and delivering health quality health care at, at the same time. So those types of investments, if done correctly, Chris, to your point, um, will really serve um, and benefit both the community health workers and, and frontline health systems um, to reach the most marginalized. Great. Dave? Thanks. Um, yeah, just to add a uh, perspective from the Global Fund, we've been working on uh, developing the investment case for next year's replenishment and, and for PPR. And in that process, have been looking at various costings of PPR uh, that have been done previously, recently by WHO, by McKinsey, and most recently by Georgetown University. And it's, it's very insightful when you get down to the, in the case of the Georgetown University costing, talking about yeah. roughly 125 billion over five years, um, all based on the joint external evaluation technical framework at intervention and activity and cost input level. And as we've kind of um, dived into that and been exploring that and unpacking it and understanding the assumptions therein, one thing that's it's fascinating is uh, over 60% of the overall costing is driven by workforce. And that's across virtually yeah. every technical domain, every IHR capacity, every JE technical domain. Um, and in particular, when we looked at surveillance um, and we really tried to understand you know, the, the predominance of workforce, including in surveillance, there's a, there's a really uh, very kind of obvious and in, 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 uh, intuitive assumption there, but still surprising, which was, it was, this was primarily about skilled workforce. This is about clinical workforce at facility level, and a community level where you need a, a health provider of some type to be on the front lines to identify a syndrome um, and, and to, uh, to understand that that syndrome, that clinical presentation, um, you know, it, whether it goes right into the, the, the Nokia phone of a community health worker in rural North Kivu and goes to a district surveillance officer for an immediate response to, to rule out the possibility of a viral hemorrhagic fever outbreak, um, where you're talking about you know, a facility-based encounter that goes into an OPD and becomes part of indicator-based reporting. The point is that skilled workforce and clinical workforce, are, are at, those are the frontline workers of early detection and response. And so the entire, the entire surveillance enterprise is about that, it, it's about primary healthcare. Right, it's about primary healthcare. Now, unpacking that further, I think we have to be be frank and acknowledging some of the challenges there. Um, the for us, for example, the Global Fund, when we we think about differentiated approaches to supporting workforce, which is in, in many contexts considered a, an important, essential, recurrent operational cost in, in government staff establishments and and, and budgets. Um, you know, it's it's not the sort of investment that donors typically like to be making. But in some instances, to do this in a, in a catalytic way, in a, in a very deliberate way, in a sequenced way, it's about kind of demonstrating the use case and building into domestic investment cases so that you can work across the machinery of government to mobilize resources, domestic resources, to, to imbue the sustainability. It can be very powerful. Um, you know, and then we get to primary health care. We have the providers, you have the health products, and there, there's a lot there. But I think the, the the bottom line is again in the in the preparedness and response frameworks today, there's a greater sensibility that those things are fundamental, and we have to be doing more in primary healthcare. So, uh, so I think it's an exciting time for for PHC for sure. Over. Yeah, and I I think um, you know that. The, also, uh, in thinking about health systems investments, you know, at least in the United States, those have been a challenge politically sometimes because, you know, a lot of lawmakers uh, very much appreciate the fact that many of our global health investments really are all about reporting concrete results every year. And, you know, I would argue that that's one more reason why it makes sense to be building 
the PPR framework on the back of existing institutions that are in the um, uh, in, in the habit of reporting every year, because that's the way to, to, one of the ways to politically maintain that investment level is if you've got institutions that are reporting concrete outcomes from those investments. So, so I think that's, that's one more, I mean, also to add in, you know, to the discussions that need to be happening in the future, all the opportunities, I mean, you're talking about the opportunity to invest in the healthcare workforce, but also innovations in data, um, and digital, uh, digital approaches to health, those can be brought in and, and give new tools to healthcare workers. All the innovations in delivery that have been accelerated in the time of COVID-19, those are more things we have to work with. We've got one more question and then we will, um, I, I think that that's all we have time for. Um, as many countries face absolute health worker shortages, the best investment for me is the one to be done before the beginning of the pandem a pandemic. We have seen that the fund mobilized by countries, the funds mobilized by countries are not used efficiently because outside the urban areas, there are no health workers to roll out the program. How, um, how will the fund, how can the fund uh, be mobilized or how can the funds be mobilized to assist countries to have uh, more qualified healthcare workers? Well, I just to echo that I, I think this is such a critical piece um, of prim the primary health care system of pandemic preparedness of strengthening health system strengthening um, is the workforce piece. And I mentioned earlier, you know, we don't want to just um, save someone from COVID to see them die from measles. Um, and, and workforce is a big piece of that, because if we're displacing the workforce that are doing routine immunization, um, we're not winning. We're not. We're not getting ahead. So that, that's a really good, important piece. I, I also just want to come back to the gender lens because we do know who are the leading caretakers in any community around the world. It, 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 it's the same people who are sort of bearing a lot of the brown. It's it's when you bring a gender lens. It's women who are often carrying uh, that that burden either professionally or as caretakers in their community. Um, and so we have to be thinking about the whole health work, workforce. Um, as a whole, you know, at, at the community level as well as the professional level, and also through that gender lens. Um, so, you know, and the last piece I'll just say is, you know, we we know well sitting here in in Washington D.C. and w anywhere anyone is calling in from right now, the vaccine hesitancy that's rising, and sort of that local health workforce we know is one of the most powerful tools to combat some of the misinformation that is spreading faster at times than the virus itself. Um, so again, that really building in that primary healthcare system and a strong workforce that's that comes out of the community is so essential on that as well. Thank you. Uh, other comments on this question about building a strong healthcare workforce, more details on that. Yeah, just just to fully agree with what Chloe was saying and and the importance of the the question she can and just to also acknowledge um, you know the contributions of everybody in the chat and and, and who's watching. I really wish we were together in person uh, to have to have the interaction. So just wanted to to say thank you. Um, you know, similarly uh, and uh, the the work that that we have been doing to support uh, human resources for health and the importance of. Uh, it, it, the inclusion of, of that gender perspective, um, ensuring that you know the, the healthcare workers and, and even the unpaid care uh, that, that women often do is, is acknowledged and supported. Um, and through the, at least from the GFF perspective, um, through the, the country plans and the country platforms um, that, 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 that we utilize to bring all of the partners together to develop a costed plan for um, RMNCAH and nutrition services, you know, having that approach, you know, how you can support health workers to deliver those services, um, which is which is really uh, important and, and, and integral. Um, and then I would just say, are, are, we, uh, are we in our final thoughts or are we just, uh, <laughs> or are we uh, still responding to that question? I'll, I'll stop, uh, David, why don't you go? <laughs> No, it's all good. Uh, yeah, no, no. Uh, this has been really great. Uh, again, I think uh, a conversation that that will continue needs to continue. This is going to be a year where we really need to um, be talking about this issue and get it right. Um, can I ask the panelists then before we go to Elisha, uh, just any final closing comments that you have? Any final reflections or thinking forward? Chloe? Well, I think just to, to reiterate that 
you know, we, we, a lot of what we need in a pandemic, we do have, we have the networks, we have institutions, we just need to invest in them um, and support them. And that includes at the community level, especially at the community level, there are clear gaps, but, um, but we, you know, we, I think we know a lot of what we need and a lot of the, the foundation is there. Um, it's the political will to really invest in it and support it and do, and do the work together. Um, and, and that political will needs to be built in sort of in peace times, because when crisis hits, it's it's very hard to to maintain a total lens of solidarity um, when nationalism takes hold. So we need to build the structures that ensure global solidarity in advance um, and, and invest in them and resource them so that they can work for us in, the, in that moment when global co cooperation is what will save us and see us through. Extremely well put. <laughs> David, any final thoughts? I would share this thought that, um, uh, you know, going forward at country level, um, that the trust that communities have in, in governments leading responses, in responses real large, um, is essential. And the only way that we can prepare that is by bringing communities into the preparedness enterprise in a really full throttled and multifaceted way, the likes of which we has not been done before. So I think we're starting to see the inklings of that, um, but this is gonna be a you know real inflection point for pandemic preparedness, but that's that's the foundation. That's, that's the disconnects that we've seen between preparedness and response. A lot of it um, lies right there. So a solvable problem. Great. Okay. Great. And Anita, um, any half half minute for the half minute left? <laughs> just just two, two, two quick points just to come back to what I was saying about being two sides to the same coin. You know, when we first started to look at the impacts on a health, essential health services, we were calling it, and we still call it the secondary health crisis, where, you know, there's nothing secondary about you know, women, children, adolescents, young people uh, losing their lives or not being able to access services. So how we can kind of switch the mindset if we're talking about primary health care and community health, health care, supporting health care workers, et cetera, um, that we kind of consider them and bolstering health systems as part of uh, as, as part of the pandemic preparedness response. You know, it's not an either or, it's not investing in one and, and, and not the other. So, you know, just you know, how we can, can reframe and then work together to build global health security. And then just to echo again, what David had said, you know, at the, at the country level, I think it's really important that, that all of us are having the conversation now, the work that we are doing, um, you know, within the three Gs and, and multilateral institutions. But, um, you know, ultimately this is, this is a partnership that is country, country led, um, country owned and and so just you know looking to see where the countries are what their needs are whether it is you know increased vaccines or delivery or you know supporting um their their health workers is kind of you know first and foremost at what we're going to need for this pandemic and, and future so thank you important final point that doing ppr right means strengthening decision making in countries and in communities absolutely um, well, thank you so much, uh, panel. This has been really wonderful. And Elisha, uh, please join us and, and uh, last word to you. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Thanks to all our panelists from this panel and the earlier ones today. I think, Chris, you, you ended this on a note that is gonna take us into um, tomorrow's discussions around health equity and how we center health equity in the global health security conversation. Uh, we're going to kick off again tomorrow at 8. We have a keynote a speech from Gatenji Gatti of AMREF, and then we move into our first plenary, which is exactly what I just said, uh, health equity and the context of global health, human, global health security and human-centered policies. So I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Thank you for the great participation, the comments, the questions. That really helps make um, a virtual symposium wonderful. So the exhibition booths are going to be open after this. If you haven't had a chance to check those out, please do so. And if not, we will see you bright and early in the morning DC time at 8 a.m. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Mm -hmm.